Hello, I'm Anthony Smith and I'm a doctor from England and I'm, I've come to, to talk to you today about palliative care. I'm so glad you're here. It would be nice to be able to ask you who you are and what your own experience is. But let me talk about this issue and the, uh, the care that we can provide, which is whole team care for a whole person or patient. I've been working in palliative care for the last 25 years in England, and uh, before that I was an orthopaedic surgeon. So there are times when I will want to talk to you, or refer back to that area of the, the work that I have done. Our subject is palliative care, which may be a subject that is not well known to you. It's a comparatively recently developed specialty. The name derives from the Latin word pallium, which is a cloak or a covering. We're talking about patients who cannot be cured, patients with advanced disease, and patients like this patient who has come to me with particular needs. We know we can't cure her because the investigations have shown that she has advanced cancer. But she's come to ask for help with pain, with sickness, help for the various anxieties she has. And we are going to try to provide covering for those, for those symptoms, to relieve the symptoms. So what is palliative care? Here's a definition of palliative care that I'm going to let you read for yourself. And I want to draw attention to a few aspects of it. Firstly, it's about people. It's about people with incurable illnesses. And it's about providing relief and support. But you see that it's not only those people, but it's also their families and their carers through these difficult times. How do you feel when you see patients that you know cannot be cured? Perhaps you take a couple of minutes just to talk to your next door neighbour, remembering someone that you have seen in the last week or two that you, couldn't, that you knew you couldn't cure, and how you felt when they came to you and say, please do something. OK, you've talked about the recent patient. I want to go back to our thinking a while ago in the UK about uh, a patient who comes with a diagnosis of cancer. And at that diagnosis, we knew, and I suppose we probably know about the same now, we knew that we could cure about 45% of those patients. So if we have 100 patients that we see in our clinic, we know that we can cure 45 of them, but we know that 55 are incurable. Perhaps that's different in your country. I don't suppose that the cure rate is higher for advanced cancer. Actually, at the end of the day, when, or the end of the, the period that we're looking at, when we look at the, that 100 patients, 30 of them have been cured, but 70 of them have actually died. And they're not, those that are cured are not all that we thought would be cured at the beginning. Sometimes, some of those that we have thought were incurable, actually things change and they are cured. Sadly, more that we think we're going to be able to cure actually end with death. Is it true then that the only people we can help 
are those that we can cure? If so, we've got a pretty poor result. But the answer is that all these patients, whether they're curable or not, need palliative care because they all come to us with symptoms and distresses and there are things that we can do for all of them. But let's ask, which patients do you think should be offered palliative care? And again, we're going to have a short break while you talk with your friends about who could be offered palliative care. So who's in your list of patients that should be offered palliative care? My list starts with cancer, because that's where palliative care originated with uh, a patient with advanced cancer who couldn't be cured, but who needed pain relief and relief of all sorts of other symptoms, who needed relief from his loneliness, who needed, needed relief from his questionings about the future. Who needs palliative care? This young man, David, who had cancer, needed palliative care. But people with progressive neurological conditions like motor neurone disease and multiple sclerosis, even Parkinson's disease in advanced conditions, need palliative care. Ah, but here's another group of people. People with advanced lung disease, end-stage lung disease, need palliative care. So do people with severe liver failure or heart failure. People with HIV or AIDS need palliative care. They need symptom relief even if they can't be cured. And there's a lot we can do these days in relation to uh, relief of symptoms. And there are others. Indeed, um, that area can be a big debate. In uh, one part of the, uh, the world, Catalonia, uh, part of Spain, the health service have, are integrating palliative care into geriatric care, care of the elderly. It may be different in your country. You may want to think about other conditions and uh, other ailments that need palliative care. But in fact, palliative care is uh, provided for these patients. It's also needed by their families because they too are involved in our caring. And those who care for the patients all these have needs. And of course, those who care for them includes the medical staff. When our medical and nursing staff get very close to patients and their families, as they do in palliative care, they may be very affected by the gradual decline and perhaps sudden death of the patient, him or herself. And they feel the need for support they also need that support uh, during the course of the illness as they care. We believe that there is always something that can be done to help. That's a message that I long to get over to our colleagues. I've so often heard people say, I'm sorry, it's cancer. There's nothing I can do for you. That's never true. There's always something that can be done to help. And palliative care provides that something for patients even though they cannot be cured. Let me stop with this patient and let you have a moment to just think about what I've been talking about. I want to introduce you to this lady. She's called Edith. And she was a lady who came to me in my, at the hospice that I was working at, which is a small hospital that I was working at, for admission because of pain. She said that she had pain in her chest and it was everywhere in her chest. 
her doctor had had her x-rayed, had had the chest x-rayed, and there was evidence of metastatic disease throughout the, the lungs, both sides. And so obviously, when uh, we heard that she had pain and that she couldn't be cured, we were willing to admit her and see whether we could give relief. I brought her in, I sat with her and took her history, and then I examined her, and to my surprise, her lungs were completely clear, there were no added sounds, no abnormal sounds, and no absent sounds. I uh, examined her bones, I compressed the, the, the lungs, and there was no tenderness in the ribs. I felt down at the back of her spine, and again, pressing down on the back of the spine, there was no tenderness. I felt in the, the supraclavicular fossae for nodes, no nodes to be felt. And the axillae were clear also. Where was this lady's pain? And so I said to her, when did this pain start? And she said, when they mutilated me, doctor. Now, mutilated is a very powerful word in English. It means badly hurt, badly damaged, badly treated. And it's a word that I would use as an orthopedic surgeon, as I was, uh, for amputations. And I actually looked quickly back at the, the shadows on the bed. Um, had I missed something? And no, she had two legs and two feet. Her hands were out, she had both arms, both hands. She had four fingers on each hand and a thumb. Mutilated? When did they mutilate you, dear? I asked. When they took my breast off, doctor. Oh, yes, I remembered. She had indeed had a mastectomy. And I had forgotten it for the moment because it was a surgical triumph. It was a beautiful result. The scar was almost invisible. There were no stitch marks. There was no pucker at either end of the, of the scar. There was no tenderness. There was no change in the sensation over that scar. It was, I would be very proud of having got a result like that. Mutilated me, she said. And that was when her pain had started. So, yes, of course she had physical pain, but that major pain of hers was a mental, emotional pain. I've got cancer, it said to her. That operation, however successful it seemed to have been, said cancer, and cancer meant death and suffering. And then she said to me, and my family don't help. They live so far away, and they never visit. So far away was um, 10 kilometers across the city. And they never visit was uh, once a fortnight when they came to me to see her and to see how she was getting on. And my husband, she said, is old and sick and doddery and blind and deaf, and he's not safe to be left alone, but you had a bed, so I had to come. The next day, an old gentleman turned up at her bedside. He'd left the house, he'd got a bus to the terminus, he'd there changed to a second bus that had taken him across the city, and he got off and he got a third bus that had taken him to where he'd asked to go, and left him a hundred kilometers, a hundred um, meters from the, the hospice. He'd walked down to the front desk, to the front entrance, come in to the front desk, had asked where he might find his wife. The lady at the front desk directed him up three flights of stairs and into the ward on the right, and you'll find her uh, down in one of the beds down on the left-hand side. And he climbed the stairs, and he went into the ward and greeted her. Blind, deaf, doddery, unsafe to be left alone. He'd done pretty well, hadn't he? He was carrying his white stick. 
But that was social pain. She had the burden of the family who didn't seem to care. She had the burden of her husband that she felt so responsible for. And then she said, and why has God done this to me? I've been a good Christian. I've gone to church twice a year. Why has God done this to me? Physical pain, mental and emotional pain, social pain, spiritual pain. This was total pain. And total pain doesn't respond to two, two paracetamol, nor does it respond to a single injection of morphine. Let's look at this lady, another lady called Vyolsa, who comes to us. She was the lady we started with uh, in this talk. She's come to us with pain. She's come to us with an incurable cervical cancer. She's come to us with a discharge, with uh, urinary problems, and with constipation. But she's also come to us with a burden for a family. Her family are scattered. She, her husband has died. She has an older son who has gone abroad looking for work, but he hasn't got any papers with him. He lost, he apparently has lost his passport. She's got a middle, a, a middle son who is out of work and at home. She has a younger son who is seven and who has, is paralyzed, partly paralyzed because of cerebral palsy. She's concerned about her family. She's concerned about the social situation, the house, because she can't earn a living she can't, she, she's going to be behind with her rent and she may lose her house. She's, uh, she is being blamed by the family, by her mother, for the fact that she has not attended church for a long time. She's been brought up Roman Catholic but has lost her faith. So all these things are burdens. If you were this woman, what of those things would be on your mind? You can see that uh, this is total pain. There are physical conditions that are, are in that total pain. There are social conditions in that total pain. There are psychological conditions in that total pain. And there are spiritual conditions in that total pain. How can we relieve this person's needs? How can we provide palliative care? Palliative care aims to pro provide relief of pain. It aims to help to control symptoms. It, help, it aims to give psychosocial support. And that whole gamut is palliative care. I'm going to stop again while you have a, a, a take a minute to talk about that with your neighbor. So as we move on from uh, what you've been thinking about, I want to remind us that a whole person, holistic approach, is, covers the physical, the psychological, the social, and the spiritual. And the aim of palliative care is not to prolong life, and it certainly is not to shorten life, but to improve the quality of life for all the time that is left. We are talking about palliative care. We are talking about living until you die. The palliative care originated with a lady called Cicely Saunders, very important doctor uh, of the, last the, the end of the last century. And she used to say, you matter because you are you, and we will support you and try and provide quality of life for all the time that you have to live. Some people think that palliative care shortens life. It does not deliberately shorten life. It aims to, to provide quality 
to the life that's left. It doesn't aim to prolong, and yet when we provide good palliative care, we often find that life is actually prolonged because people are able to enjoy quality. Sometimes we find that, in fact, it is much shorter than we had expected because they feel comfortable and able to say goodbye. So what is quality of life? And we would like to suggest this, that it is a matter of being able to carry out the things that are important to that person. So when this person comes to you and uh, you know you can't cure her, what are you going to ask her? How are you going to provide that quality of life? You need to help the person to set realistic goals, but you need to be able to ask her about the, the aims that she has. What is going to make life really worthwhile for you? And when we ask that question, we get surprising answers. I remember one patient who came to me uh, with the sort of problems that Violsa has. And she came to me with, and she, she was jaundiced, she was very thin, she had no appetite, she was vomiting, she had pain, she had discharges from various um, areas and she had horrifying advanced cancer. And I said to her, what would you like me to try to do for you? And I thought of the jaundice, I thought of the itch, I thought of the pains, I thought of the, the discharge, I thought of the incontinence, I thought of the constipation. She said, I want you to try to get my daughter and my husband reconciled. Wow! I'd never thought of that as being one of the aims that this person had, the, the overriding aim. And yet it was so important for her. And during the next 10 days, when we were controlling the pain, controlling the symptoms, enabling her to talk to her husband, enabling her to talk to her daughter, we were able to see those two people come together and be reconciled. And that was a triumph. It was only 10 days, but it was so worth doing. Now, who's going to do that? I can't, I'm not, a, I'm a doctor. I'm not a nurse and I can't, I'm not good at making beds and doing nursing things and giving injections. No, don't ask me to give injections. I'll take blood, but somebody else is much better at doing the injections. What about the social care? What about the spiritual care? Am I able to do all of that? Are you able to do all of that? It involves working with other people. It involves working with other programs of care. It involves working with different people with different skills. Here's my team. I am so fortunate to have a team of Nurse, nurses, doctor, counsellor, chaplain. I have a physiotherapist who is able to come and join the team from time to time to provide support. And here is the team meeting. Um, at the beginning of each day, the team will meet for a while just to look through the patients that are in difficulties to look through the notes of some patients that we're going to be admitting or seeing today, and we will talk about what we can provide for them. Is that the total team? Who else might you want to add to the team? Who else ought I to add? Oh yes, the patient is part of the team, and the patient's family is part of the team. And so we expand this idea of the team. We work together. I can't do for that patient what she can do, what her family can do, but I will do what I can do, and I will work together with the rest of the team 
to support the patient. Remember, there's always something that can be done to help. So, who might be involved in caring for this lady now or in the future? We've talked about Vilsa, we've talked about her different needs. There's always something that can be done to help. We've covered a lot, haven't we, in this talk. I suppose the thing I particularly want you to remember is that there is always something that can be done to help. It's never ever true, there's nothing we can do for you.